Time for a break from our show to pay the bills. Check out beacons.ai slash comics fun profit for all the C4 FAP links you could ever need all in one place. You can provide feedback, listen, support, share, enjoy these. We have our Patreon there. You can buy us a beer or a coffee. You can check out our Instagrams, our Twitters, our Facebooks. Check out our YouTube page. You can email us. You can listen to our podcasts on Patreon, if you're a subscriber, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, on Podbean. We have Google Podcasts on there. We have an Amazon wish list. You want to buy Kyle and I something? Fine. You can do that here. We appreciate it. We have Kyle's RPG podcast listed on there. So you can check out his Dork Day Afternoon offerings. We have Cowabunga links. So you can check out the Cowabunga Deep Discount FOC and Pre-Order list. Get on that. That's our LCS. So you can check that out as well. And we want to just give you opportunities to say hi, to check out what we're doing, support us if you would like, or just listen. Check out beacons.ai slash comics fun profit for all the c4 fap links you could ever need thanks back to the show aloha this is jason from hawaii welcome to a special edition of the comics for fun and profit podcast in this episode i will be interviewing writer artist richard fairgrave he is here to promote his latest book four color heroes it is an lgbtq plus young adult graphic novel from fan base press richard welcome to the comics for fun and profit podcast how are you doing today i'm pretty good how are you oh, i'm doing good thank you very much um and richard i'm just going to go over your brief history of your incredible work and i'm going to say jump in feel free to correct me or if you want to jump in go hey i want to talk about this a little bit more that's fine too sure okay so um now um you have an as i mentioned you have an amazing credible um um body of work that ranges from children's books to graphic novels and so forth and now correct me if i'm wrong you have about 250 titles under your belt is that correct i think uh four color heroes would have been my 259th mm -hmm. uh, published book but um, then two other ones have jumped out ahead of it that are coming out in January and March. So actually it'll be my 261st. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. And then at three years old, you started to make your own books in your spare time. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Um, I got in uh, I got in some trouble. I'd learned to read and write really early because yeah. my father was convinced that, uh, that everyone at kindergarten would already know how to read and write. And I had to be ahead of them. Mm -hmm. um, and so I started making these books and I made this book called, uh, it was Donald Duck in the Haunted House. Ooh. And it was, Donald was waiting for Mickey to go into a haunted house together and Mickey didn't show up. So mm -hmm. Donald goes in on his own and he gets to the attic and he meets a ghost and the ghost is sad because he has no friends. And Donald realizes he has no friends either. So he takes out a gun and shoots himself so he can stay with the ghost forever. And I got in a whole bunch of trouble for it because I'm from New Zealand, and so in New Zealand, you start kindergarten at like three and a half. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, like, my parents were called in, and this lovely woman named Janet, who was, you know, like to stop me from eating Play Doh, was like, We're pretty worried about Richard. And I was like, I can get in trouble for writing things. This is the most attention I've ever had. I'm going to do this always. Yeah. Um, cut to like six months later, it's Valentine's Day, and uh, we have to draw a picture of people who are in love. And everyone else draws, which is a messed up assignment, by the way. Everyone else draws their parents. I draw yes. Postman Pat and Reverend Tim's kissing. Again, I get in trouble. And then I'm like, I can get in trouble for drawing, too. <laughs> and that, that's my whole origin, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to say that, you know, but that Donald, but that's, but that's a great story about, you know, Donald Duck meets a ghost. Basically, both of them don't have no friends. Donald Duck shoots himself. Because, because... I remember growing up as a kid watching these cartoons and of course usually it's you know you get one of those where it's like um yes but like there's a ghost and like I don't know Tom and Jerry or Tom is alive he gets run over by a car he you know he, be, so he, you know, he becomes a ghost and it it, it, it just feels natural as a kid's watching this you know <laughs> well yeah and, and you and I are old enough that like I think nowadays like 
Bluey is never going to shoot themselves in the face, right? Yes. But when we were coming up, Yosemite Sam was shooting himself in the face all the time. So was Daffy Duck. So was Elmer Fudd. It yes. was very, very ordinary for people to pull guns from nowhere and shoot themselves in the face on children's television. Yes. <laughs> which, which, I don't know, looking back on it may not have been the best thing. But again, I grew up in a country that didn't really have guns. So <laughs> I was in less danger. <laughs> But it, but I'm going to say, and and I'm not, you know, I'm not making any social commentary. But it's kind of sad that how times have changed, you know. And yeah, <laughs> listen, it's okay. I'm going to go off on a little bit of a tangent for just a second. Yeah, it's like, it's times haven't changed. Times have remained relatively static, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. And we are now very upset when we see like old cartoons that have. Things like that. Now, now, okay, don't get me wrong. There's stuff in old cartoons that's real bad. Yes. And it shouldn't be shown. Yeah. But, like, the cartoon violence mm-hmm. has always been used as a scapegoat for things or always been used as a distraction for things in the same way that, like, um, if you ever want to know, like, how messed up culture is, mm-hmm. uh, serial killers don't use guns. Mm-hmm. And there are far fewer serial killers than there have ever been mm-hmm. because people don't, you know do it methodically and in small numbers anymore yeah so like six years ago i think mm-hmm. they changed the designation of what to find a serial killer so that they could say there were more serial killers again to distract us from the actual problem of gun violence which was not being perpetuated by daffy duck yeah <laughs> oh man. now back on track yeah so let's get back on track okay <laughs> all right now at age seven you wrote your first comic that introduced um, and your original character, Ghost Ghost, is that correct? Yeah, it, it wasn't my first comic. It was just my first comic that I published. Oh, okay. Um, I'd been making, like, I had a, I had a character uh, called Bald Man, who was just a man who was bald, who got described as a bald man. And mm-hmm. his logic was anyone with the word man at the end of their name is usually a superhero, so I must be as well. Yeah. Um, and he, like... It, he had a he had a friend called Captain Invisible who was an invisible man who was determined to be considered a captain. So he wore a full pirate costume over his invisible body. Um, and he had an invisible parrot on his shoulder who just had an eye patch, which yeah. was a nightmare to draw. Uh, and there was a and they had a, a character called uh, Spy Face who was a person <laughs> who had a tattoo of the word spy on their face. Uh, they did not have great adventures uh, but no ghost ghost was the first one like i had never seen a comic book like i knew they existed because mm-hmm. like michelangelo read comics and uh, the turtle not the artist obviously um michelangelo read comics and bart simpson read comics yeah. and there were four comic stores in the whole country so mm-hmm. i had just never actually seen one in real life so i assumed these were like a thing that people used to make and old people who made tv knew about them so they gave the characters on the tv shows these things to read and i was like they seem really cool though i bet if i started making my own ones i could become a millionaire really fast because i'm yeah. the only person in the entire world making comics mm-hmm. So I draw this little book called Ghost Ghost about a ghost who struggles with like invisibility and loneliness, again, a common theme. Um, and he's trying to, he's sad because no one's scared of him because they can't see him. So he goes to try and get a ghost costume and he goes to the linen store and says, where are the white sheets? But they can't see him, so they don't help him. So he goes to the paint store to buy some paint to paint himself so they'll be able to see him. And he's carrying the bucket of paint up to the the, the checkout. And so it's just a floating bucket of paint. And someone points at it and says, ah, a ghost. And he's like, oh, finally. (laughs) Um, And my school library had just gotten, I've told this story so many times, so I'm sorry if anyone's hearing it again. But (laughs) my school library had just gotten in this big VHS collection. um, And it had been like a real fight to get it. (laughs) And a lot of people were really opposed to it. So like libraries meant to be for books. (laughs) And my argument would be not a lot of books in that library anyway. so the the librarian was like really passionate about keeping it and i knew this i also noticed that the uh stickers the barcode security stickers were the same as the ones at my local video store Uh so i got a bunch of kids to get videos out from the library give them to me i took them to the video store slid them in under the sensor Uh went to the adult section swapped the labels out then returned a bunch of adult films to the library the next morning I went into the library and said to the librarian, if you give me free photocopying, I will tell you which films in here are porn. 
She didn't believe me. I went and grabbed what seemed like a random tape off the shelf, shoved it in the player, started playing at a scene that I'd queued up. She agreed. And so then I was able to start producing my comics and selling them at like school events, like athletics days sort of, that I was not taking part in and like school dances and things. And um, so Ghost Ghost made me $400. Mm-hmm. And I was like, that's pure profit because, you know, labor doesn't count for anything when you're seven. Mm-hmm. And uh, I bought like... I, I like to tell people that I bought a buttload of Ninja Turtle toys because it sounds cooler, but the truth yeah. is I just bought Power Rangers. Mm-hmm. So a little bit embarrassed about that part, but I like by <laughs> age nine, I had like I had Dragon Zord, Megazord, and Titanus, who is the dumbest and most expensive of the toys. Mm-hmm. Doesn't even do anything, just his back opens up and the other one sits inside him. Yeah. <laughs> Holy cow, Richard. I mean, first off. For, for you to be at a young age to really think about, um, you know, really thought provoking stories, you know, I mean, like with you know, um, you know, how can Don, you know, Donald Duck and he meets a ghost can be friends, they 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 bond, yeah, you know, and and then with ghost ghosts, you know, about you know, no one can the invisibility, no one sees him, um, you know, and, and you know, it, I mean. For you know, for seven, for someone that young, that's amazing. Because I, I'm going to say, because probably like most kids, I'm going to say, even if I made a because when I made a comic book or tried to draw a scene, it's always Star Wars, Luke Skywalker fighting Darth Vader, you know, or something. Well, see, this is my advantage. I've never seen Star Wars. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. So, so if I had, maybe I would have, um, maybe I would have drawn some outer space monsters or whatever happens in those films. No, but but I I just think it's more amazing that it, it that your stories were already start to be a little bit more thought provoking already, especially at a young age. I I think I'm gonna I'm gonna disagree with you there actually, oh, which is a great way to have an interview. <laughs> I'm so good. Yeah. At this. Um, I think that if you look at anything that a kid writes, um, mm-hmm. if a kid is writing a story, mm-hmm. there is stuff in it they don't know it's there. Like I would love to pretend that I was this incredibly precocious and knowledgeable child who fully understood the deeper meanings of what I was saying. But it wasn't. I was just like, I'm interested in these things because who knows why? And Mm -hmm. it's only with the kind of the ability to look back and put it into the wider context of like weirdo outcast kid with a funny wonky eye that um, that I'm able to say like, yeah, probably I was feeling a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I also have to say that's pretty ingenious of how you got ghost ghost to be printed. (laughs) That's pretty cool. (laughs) Well, so my my mother, I'll, I'll fully credit my mother on this, uh, and she hates being credited with this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, she has the mind of a criminal, um, and she kind of always taught us to, like, you know, me and my sisters were sort of taught to try and think, like, not necessarily, like, how can we take advantage of others, but, like, yeah. be aware that people will take advantage of you, so know their weaknesses, yes. or yes. see the opportunities before they happen. Mm-hmm. Um and I remember I was I was six years old and my mother was telling my older sister, Susan, and I the story about how when she was a kid, her family would go for a walk down to the local store and buy ice creams. Uh-huh. And she would walk behind the rest of the family, eat her ice cream as quickly as she could, uh-huh. and then drop the cone on the ground and start screaming. So people thought she'd dropped her whole ice cream and would get a second one. And my sister, being the like earnest weirdo dork that she is, said... I wouldn't do that. It's stealing. And my mother looked at her and without without missing a beat, just said, I am so disappointed in you. I'm sorry. I don't mean to laugh, but that's <laughs> and I was just like, yeah, that's it. That's like that's that's the lesson there. You gotta find gotta find the way to finesse every situation. Yes. So that you can, you know, and like I I do not use this to hurt anyone else, I hope. Yeah. Um, but I certainly have like I'm always able to look at a situation and think, okay, how can I make this the best? How can I, Mm -hmm. um, like, okay, people are, people are wandering around conventions and they're sort of bored because they're mostly looking at things. I'm going to have something that makes a noise to attract them and a game to play. So like when I would do big comic conventions, I have a spinning wheel where, uh, for 50 cents, you get to spin the wheel and you have a one in 180 chance of winning a $2 comic. Mm-hmm. And people are just excited. They 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 don't care about winning the comic. Even they just want to pay fifty cents to spin a wheel because they get to hear that clicking noise. Yeah. Or um, 
you know, or, or a stupid, we had another game where people had to throw ducks into other ducks, which was impossible to win. And mm-hmm. people just wanted to touch the little squeaky ducks. Mm-hmm. And for some reason, everyone wanted to put them in their mouths. And when I'd see them do that, I'd be like, oh, I clean those things. I know how gross they are before <laughs> each show. So oof a doof. <laughs> Richard, that, that's pretty cool. But And I'm sorry, we, I got to continue on because if not, should sure. just be here talking about sorry. Yes, we should get to the actual comic we were talking about. <laughs> yes. I could talk all day. Oh my god, listeners, we are in for a treat. We really are. Okay, so now again, correct me if I'm wrong. In 2007, you graduated from um Elam School of Fine Arts with a Bachelor yeah. of Fine Arts. Um, and also you got a postgraduate diploma in secondary teaching from the University of Auckland. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Okay. And then in 2017, you received the Storylines Notable Book Award. Um, I actually, I think I received, uh, I received two of those in 2016, and I think I got three in 2017. Oh, okay. All right. I put out a lot of books, and they're all really notable, apparently. (laughs) And then I'm going to go over some of your works. Um, now, correct me if on on the title on this one, um, Blastosaurus, that yep. was co-written by Paul Eiding, and that was published through Golden Apple Books. Is that correct? Yes. Um, and so that one, that one was actually, uh, the American run of it was through Golden Apple in 2018 and 19. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there was, <laughs> the original New Zealand run started in 2000. Eight, I want to say, mm-hmm. uh, and we we ran that for ten years there as the we were we were the highest selling comic uh, for for almost ten years while I lived there. Yes, mm-hmm. and then of course some of your other works was Gorillas in Our Mist, Black mm-hmm. Sand Beach, and Haunted Hill. Yes. Okay. Now I'm going to ask: Did I miss anything, or do you want to add anything else? And just to put a spotlight on our listeners to check out your work. Uh, well, I mean, look, there's, as I said, there's literally 261 titles, but um, uh, if you go to richardfairgrade.com, there's about two and a half thousand pages of free comics up there for people to read through, um, complete runs of most of my older stuff. Uh, everything that I've been able to rescue from hard drives as I've shifted between countries is there. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. All right. Actually, I'm going to jump ahead to one question because you already mentioned your website, where can followers, um, where can listeners follow you on social media? Um, I am most active on Twitter.com as long as it's around. Uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm the only Richard Fairgrave in the entire world, so I'm mm-hmm. very easy to find everywhere. Uh, but yeah, I, I seem to be perpetually on Twitter talking about comic books. Okay. And then also, I want to, uh, and then before we jump into our interview, I want to give a big shout out to um, Barbara Dillon, editor of. Uh, Editor in chief of Fanbase Press for setting up this interview. So, Barbara, thank you very much. I'm going to ask, do you want to add anything to the shout out to Fanbase Press? Um, just that they're fantastic. Um, you know, I've been in this game long enough to know that there is um there's good and bad in, in the publishing world and in the independent publishing world, there is there are people who are working their absolute hardest and and you know, trying their best all the time. But there are uh, only a small handful who do it with absolute integrity and respect for the creators at every turn. Mm-hmm. And, and Barbara and Bryant and Fanbase have been absolutely terrific with that. And then, um, and also, too, I want to let listeners know that I got some of the information from a YouTube podcast, um, Two Geeks Talking. Um, and I'm sorry, I forgot to write down the um, date of the interview yeah. that you did. Oh, uh, that's so, Kurt Sasso. Okay. And then I also got information off of your um, website, Richard, and also um, from the fan base, um, fan base press, press friends. Okay. Now, yeah. Richard, we're just going to go over your origin story. So may I, may I ask for our listeners, can you please tell a li- tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay, well, uh, I am a... I'm just I'm a I'm a I'm a curmudgeonly old man trapped in a 37 year old's body. I used to say trapped in a young man's body, but um, <laughs> I'm 37 now, so everything just hurts. Uh, I'm a workaholic. I get up every morning at 4:45. I work 
until usually 11 at night. Um, and I just cannot stop producing comics. Uh, this year, because of some uh, mess ups on the, on the behalf of a couple of other publishers and delays because of COVID, I've had to draw 988 pages of comics. It is currently December 12th, and I have 141 pages left to color by the end of the year. I am exhausted all of the time. Mm -hmm. um, I split my time between uh, my house in Canada and my house in Hollywood, uh, where I mostly spend my time in an office in the world's oldest mall and take selfies with a ceramic fish in the base of a fountain that is, um, I, I like to think of as my best friend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, I'm going to say thank you very much for your time. Yes. I, oh, my God. But yes, thank you very much. No problem. I'll just I'll just stay up an hour later tonight. I'm drinking a Red Bull while we talk, so it's all good. Okay. All right. Now, if, you know, um, you know, I, I um, if you don't mind me asking, you know, like, what was what was the first comics or even Sunday comics or manga or anything that, you know, that you came across? Um, so I, because I didn't know comic store, like I didn't know comics existed and I didn't have access to a comic store. Um, my grandfather had a, uh, like one Calvin and Hobbes strip, uh, oh. that was like, uh, you know, stuck up with a fridge magnet on the fridge. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, such a, I can't even remember what it was. It was something about like a bully pushing Calvin off the swing, I think. Yeah. Uh, and he thought that was very funny because a child fell down, mm -hmm. uh, and, <laughs> And I, that was like really the only one I'd ever seen. Okay. Um, and then when I was uh, 16, I decided I should just try and find comics. I don't know how to do this. I didn't have the internet at home. Mm -hmm. And I thought if there's going to be comics anywhere, that they'll be in the city. So mm -hmm. I got on a bus and went to the city and I wandered around into like every skanky dark alleyway I could find, hoping to find a comic book store mm -hmm. that, or yeah. like a secondhand bookshop that might have some like stuff like just i was just looking for grimy places you know yes and i actually found one like i and i found a, a comic store that was moving that day and they had like all of their back issues were hugely discounted and so i walked in with this hope of maybe one day finding a comic book and i walked out with like a pile of 300 um just random issues of things from all over the place and uh, the only new thing I picked up was uh, uh, the first the first part of the two part uh, I feel sick by John and Vasquez, which okay. is a follow up to Johnny the Homicidal Maniac, and I will always insist is far superior, but only because I read it first. <laughs> Holy cow! <laughs> That's pretty amazing. Now I'm gonna now off the cuff question out of that pile of three hundred comics, were there any like, well. Any key issues that they kind of, you know, that key, if we look back now, any key issues? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Heaps. It was just like a bunch of cool stuff. Um, I got I got a first printing of uh, The Killing Joke. There was a first, I had Sandman issue eight, which is first appearance of death. For a dollar. Yeah. Um, like, it was just all random. None of them were in great condition. I got like six issues of Miracle Man. Um, but none of them in order, so I couldn't read it. Fortunately, I found someone who actually owned it because when they saw me reading some stuff, they were like, oh, you like comics? Here, borrow all of these. Mm -hmm. um, and then, like, I, they, they weren't valuable issues or anything, but a bunch of, of completely disconnected Ninja Turtle stories from different places. Mm -hmm. And a couple of... I, I read all of this stuff, and a couple of them were, like, really cool and, like, sparked these very cool ideas, and I'd love to know how it played out. Uh -huh. but, um but I never actually got to find out. So still a mystery. Why was Donatello wearing a Shredder costume? I don't know. He <laughs> just was. But isn't it, it, but it's so cool because I mean, because when I got into comics too, it's like, I didn't know, well, no, this is back in the seventies. And also too, back then it was like, you, you know, we really didn't have like a local comic shop. It was either drugstore or wherever, or even like those, you know, three comics for you know, in a dollar for a pack or something. Mm -hmm. But it's always so cool to just pop open, just jump right in, and then, and then it, you realize that oh, there's a there's part two. You know. <laughs> well, see, this is the thing. Everyone always talks about how we need to make comics more accessible, and everything should be a standalone issue. And and everyone thinks about it in terms of kids want to have the whole story. Uh -huh. The truth is, kids don't care about having the whole story. Kids yeah. will read the same single 
issue of something a hundred times if they enjoy it. Yes. Like, and they don't care if it's the first one or the last one. They will make up their own story because that's the thing. When you're when you are a kid, before you've been beaten down by the pain of being 37, you can read a story and just make up the rest and have a great time. Yeah. No, that that's true. I I you, because the thing is I remember reading and very old I it was part two of Brave and the Bold issue with Batman, Metal Men, and Green Arrow. It was the second, it was part two. It was the it was the conclusion of a um, a two-part story. All I know was I think in the beginning, Tin, the metal the middleman Tin was dead. And I remember just kept reading it over and over again because I I didn't know, you know. I can't I, because I figured I can't get, go back and get part one because it's yeah you know, as a kid it's like yeah it's gone right it's done with yeah. it but years later I found that I you know I found it in some dollar bin or something like that so yeah and then when I read it I was like oh okay well so that's what happened all right you know but then I was a little older too so <laughs> yeah I think like sometimes it's just more fun to never know there was there's there's so many you know I think the, the way that we make comics like more accessible is simply make them more physically accessible just have comics everywhere kids will pick them up yeah. they'll read standalone pieces they'll trade with their friends they'll talk to other people i mean this is uh, such a huge part of it uh for me is that like comics has led to a community like mm -hmm. i i found a comic store i liked i made friends there some of them i still have 20 years later um nice. and you know, every time I've walked into a, a, a comic store, a good comic store, because we know there are bad ones, but every time I've walked yes. into a good one, mm -hmm. I've, like, met a bunch of strangers, and we all talk, because for that moment, we all have this thing in common of, we like this place, so let's be friends while we're here. And we become children again, because it is that same level of, I also like the color blue, let's hang out. Yeah. And when you were a kid, if you pick up a single issue of a comic, and you read it, and it makes absolutely no sense, then you walk over to another kid, and you say... Do you know what happened to this? Do you know what happened here? And that other kid says, yes, I do. And then they tell you the thing. And then you don't need to read the comic because you've shared something. And then you have a friend who you share comics with. And maybe I'm being like all idealistic because I didn't have this, but it sounds wonderful having friends. <laughs> but then, yeah, but, and, but I think also too, and, and I'm going to say, if it's in a, if it's a nice civil conversation and stuff, you know, you, you know, you can do that back and forth you know thing where it's like well but but superman can't do this why does superman do? and they'll be like well he remembered this issue or or no he can do this or and, and it's just that nice like you say it's that nice shared experience yeah and like you know what's really fun talking to someone about all the different things superman can do in it's... different versions you know what's not fun saying like talking to someone who's like i hate this superman because his belt buckle is the wrong shape mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh yes, yes. <laughs> so, yeah, I, Richard, I hear you, and if you don't mind, I'm I'm just gonna start moving on to the next question sure. already. Oh, yeah, absolutely. All right. So, all right. I'm uh because um because when you started to write your stories when you were young, what was the spark that lit the fire? in you to start writing at a very young age i think i just really uh the writing part was that i just really liked mm -hmm. telling stories um i my, my my father used to tell stories to us when we we're like nice. at, at night he would like lie on the floor of of uh it's actually my sister's bedroom and i would be in a chair and she would be in her bed and my father would just like lie on the floor and tell us a story until we were kind of like dopey enough from being in the dark for 20 minutes that would be willing to go to sleep and his stories were garbage like they were just awful mm -hmm. it was about these pandas who sometimes went to a train station and there was like an evil train conductor who was mean to pandas for some mm -hmm. it was just just dumb city and i would just sit there being like no that's not what happened you know you're 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 saying the wrong things you're getting it wrong that didn't happen no i remember this part <laughs> <laughs> and I would just constantly critique his stories and I'd get so frustrated and I'd be like, I'm just going to start making it my own. This is going to be much better if I write my own stories. <laughs> so it was, I guess it was spite. 
Okay. <laughs> um, I'm gonna ask you, and how did you, how did it feel to have your name on your first published um work at a young age? Well, Ghost Coast didn't have my name on it because I thought I wanted to be able to like ditch the evidence if I ever got in trouble. Okay. And I, and I just thought like, well, if my name is on this, then mm -hmm. it's definitely me. I mean, it's obvious me anyway but like a, a lot of kids don't realize this if the adult can't prove it then mm -hmm. you can get away with whatever you like yeah. just never admit to anything <laughs> um i think the first the first book and i was i i uh i think the first time i actually put my name on the cover of a book was a graphic novel i did when i was 16 called being the antichrist mm -hmm. and it was about uh a, a a 12 year old boy who was too immature to bring about the end of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and it turns out that he'd been too immature to do it like mm -hmm. for thousands of years. And this was like his hundredth lifetime going through and he'd like reached puberty again. So it was like a really difficult point for him. Um, and, and that was sort of a disastrous mess of a book. Mm -hmm. But again, I was 15 or 16 when I, when I wrote it. <laughs> But it was the first time I had my, my name on the cover, and uh, that was actually the first book that I had uh, that I was selling at a, at a convention because uh, wow. right after I found that comic store, yes, uh, I went back to go to like the new location the following week, mm -hmm. and I was uh, walking down the street and I saw this big line of people, and I was like, I wonder what they're lining up for, mm -hmm. and I look and there was this big truck of uh, of craft dinner. And I was like, oh, I've always heard about craft dinner and I've never tried it because it wasn't mm -hmm. available in New Zealand. So I wander over and these people are just carrying boxes. I'm like, what's going on? And this guy says, if you help us carry boxes, I'll let you in for free. I'm like, free, free wow. entry to some kind of mac and cheese event? That sounds amazing. So I carried all these boxes in and it turned out that I was in a comic convention. <laughs> Holy cow! <laughs> so I wandered around uh -huh. and I found this like another, like another comic store. I had a booth there and they sold me From Hell, Watchmen, Dark Knight Returns, the first volume of Sandman, wow. and uh, a Batman Judge Dread crossover that absolutely sucked butts. Mm -hmm. And um, I just, like, I had this, like, wonderful time. I stayed there for a couple of hours, and I said to the, the people at the comic store, I was like, what do you do tomorrow if you sell too much stuff? And they're yeah. like, we just, I don't know, empty tables? Yeah. And I said... I have a bunch of books. Can I bring them in? And they're like, you can't sell used books. I was like, no, no, they're by me. Yeah. And so I came in the next day and like just started selling books. And I was like, I don't know, they're, they're 10 bucks each, I guess. And sold like 50 of them and bought a lot of absolute junk at that show. <laughs> but I was like, oh, cool. Okay. Well, I was, I'm about to finish high school pretty soon. So maybe this will be my job. And then it just was. Holy Wow, <laughs> Richard, that's great. That's yeah, incredible. I, like, <laughs> oh. I just, I, I've, I have just somehow stumbled into so many things, uh -huh. and I think a, a lot of people think it's luck. I think it is uh, an absolute willingness to wander into a dangerous situation mm -hmm. or wander in, like I, I kind of make every decision based on what will be a more interesting story later. Yes, and usually that means I'm saying yes to something dumb. Uh, and you know, adventures happen. I would like with uh, someone asked me recently, uh, my book Haunted Hill. Mm -hmm. uh, the first volume of it is about like kind of a wild, like uh, one of those endless nights of adventure where you get in a car with some strangers and some stuff happens. And they're like, mm -hmm. "Well, how'd you come up with the stuff?" I was like, "Oh no, that literally just happened to me." So I wrote about it because I was walking home one night and a car pulled up and said, "Hey, Mark." And I said, "Yup." And I jumped in and they said, "You're not Mark." And I was like, "Absolutely, that is true." Where are we going? And then like you know cut to five hours later i'm teaching these people in their 20s how to break into a house <laughs> young people don't know skills anymore i guess is my point <laughs> well, i just i have to i that's pretty cool <laughs> you know <laughs> but i, I will do... say having having my name on the cover of a book the first time around kind of felt like like par for the course at that point mm -hmm. uh there was a long period in the middle where i had other people's names on the book with me um mm -hmm. 
some some good people, some yeah. really terrible people, and uh, only only this year have I started having a few books finally start coming out again that are like not being weighed down by uh, certain people, mm -hmm. and that feels really good. Like it's like I look at that, I'm like, this is yeah, this is a book that's by Richard Fairgray. It is written, penciled, inked, colored, mm -hmm. formatted, and prepared for print by Richard Fairgray, and that is that is all. That is pretty cool. Now, and I'm going to say that's kind of the perfect segue to your um to your book that we're going to talk about, Four Color Heroes. Now, for our listeners, what is the story about? So it is. Uh, I mean, the the basic pitch is two young boys, like from from very different backgrounds, fall in love through comic books. Mm -hmm. uh, the the bigger story is it's. Uh, in the kind of nebulous early 2000s in New Zealand, in the middle of the protests against the Civil Union Bill, mm -hmm. which was, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, um, civil unions were kind of the, we're not going to let you have gay, gay marriage, but we'll let you have a sort of similar legal thing, mm -hmm. uh, which sucks, obviously, but it was still a big turning point. And now there is gay marriage, so mm -hmm. great. Um, <laughs> we can all relax. That's a joke. We cannot ever relax. Um, but in the middle of all of that, there was a lot of protests and, and, and people screaming enough is enough and horrible rhetoric going around about how terrible the gays were and how they're going to ruin everything. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, like, I would like to I would like to see what, you know, I remember what my life was like through that. I was 18 or 19 through it, and it largely didn't affect me, but it was part of the background noise of my life. Mm -hmm. um so the story is about uh a boy who is who has been homeschooled uh and uh, from a very religious home mm -hmm. um yeah. think think westboro baptist church but you know more mm -hmm. uh, a little less intense and on the other side of the world yeah um and he's he starts going to a regular high school for the first time because the church that he's part of the school they were going to build themselves gets blocked which uh true story and um when he's there his his mother has said to him just stay inside the classroom at, at lunchtime because i don't want you like get, having bad influences from other kids and of course what this means is he's in this classroom with this one other boy who's in there because he's in trouble like mm -hmm. he's in detention for being bad mm -hmm. uh, and so it's these two just kind of keep getting thrown together for opposite reasons yeah. and he gets uh the, the the their names are oscar and patrick i'm i'm butchering this i'm sorry but no, no. Um, I'm, I'm i'm currently coloring page 86 and i'm sort of doing it out of order for a lot of reasons and so all these little pieces of the story are floating in my head right now because i'm trying to keep track of like well i know i know that that scene is going to have the same lighting as this scene so i'll do that one next so i can do comparative things and Anyway, let me try and get the story in order. They're in the classroom together at lunchtime, and Oscar is sitting reading a book by his his the, the reverend of his church, the bishop of his church, mm -hmm. and Patrick is reading a comic book, mm -hmm. uh, a superhero book about a character yes. named Calicos. And Oscar cannot stop looking at it. He knows mm -hmm. he's not allowed to read it, but he can't take his eyes off of it. Yeah. And Patrick sees this and is like, We'll read it then. Just read it. He's kind of nudging him, and he's and then, and eventually Patrick finds the loophole of how about you don't read it, but I'll tell you about it, so you yeah. still get the experience. Mm -hmm. And so throughout the story, uh, Oscar will meet up with Patrick, and you know their lives are very much getting in the way, but mm -hmm. they will meet up once a month, and Patrick will tell him what has happened in the latest issue of Telecos. Mm -hmm. And so throughout the book, we see the Telecos comic book, yes. but only as it's imagined by by Oscar. So oh. we never see the real version of the book. Mm -hmm. And you know, it, 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 it's as he learns about it more and starts to understand it, form the memo type of a superhero, it, it becomes more accurate to what a real comic book would look like. But mm -hmm. the first time he's, it's described to him, it's about this man who wears a suit of blue and gold and came from the stars in this huge ship to fight monsters. And so when he imagines it, it's a it's a man in a blue and gold business suit with a cape coming off of it on mm -hmm. a huge pirate ship flying down from the sky. Mm -hmm. and, and so there has to be all these kind of clarifications every time he asks Patrick a question about it. 
And so it's just about like them forming this bond of like finding a, a safe place with each other mm -hmm. and the the comparison of like incredibly anti-gay rhetoric coming from the church and the incredibly anti-gay rhetoric coming from like the very toxic masculine uh life of of patrick mm -hmm. and and so like the two of them finding the safe place with each other throughout the story oh okay that's that is that's amazing wow that's amazing thank you um I'm gonna, the next question I'm gonna ask is more like a process question is that, you know, I saw some of the preview pages mm -hmm. uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but to me, it looked like there was a little bit of a manga influence, you know, um, it, it, you know, was that intentional or I, 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 I'm just asking, that's an off the cuff question. Yeah, I, I think that like, you know, there's influence from all over the place. I've, in spite of not reading any comics till I was in my late teens, I have since mm -hmm. read thousands. Um, I think that the, I don't read a lot of manga, but I think the influence is that, you know, manga is a, is a, a form where smaller personal stories are far more present yes. than they are in like big two comics. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that like that influence is very clear in a lot of my work. You can, you know, I, I mostly focus on characters problematizing small moments um, and then finding the big, big visual excitement to go along with it. Uh, but I think that, like, by and large, it's, it's. I kind of use comics as a way of translating the real world. Um, my particular vision problems mean that I actually see everything in two dimensions. Mm -hmm. And so, like, the world looks a little bit like a comic book to me anyway, mm -hmm. because there isn't the kind of the same depth that other people have. Mm -hmm. um and so i'm i i really enjoy when i notice something ordinary that i see a way to make beautiful like by just changing the lighting in a in a classroom so that it's a little bit more golden or like framing these tiny things i think you could like there's so much more of a challenge to tell a story visually in a in an ordinary setting than in mm -hmm. like outer space or whatever mm -hmm. uh and i i I really enjoy that. And I actually, in this book, because I'm getting to do the superhero stuff as well, yes. um, I'm noticing this, like, like if I'm drawing Oscar and Patrick in, like, a abandoned area of the school behind a classroom uh -huh. where there's overgrown grass and a tree stump and a big old wooden fence and a tree with its leaves falling off slowly, mm -hmm. and I can, like, really play with the depth and reality of that space... Mm -hmm. I can create some of those interesting shots in the book. Mm -hmm. And then when I try and do like telecoast versus the harpoonicorns from space, mm -hmm. it it sort of feels like not 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 tortured as such, but it's certainly like the thing that should be easy to make dynamic mm -hmm. becomes far more static as I'm working on it. Wow. Um my next question I'm going to ask is, um, um, you know, before you started to do Four Color Heroes, you know, did you write out a full script before you start to draw the pages or? Yeah, oh. so normally, so I, I have a weird process. Um, with some of my books, it's very much a situation of like, I'm uh, writing as I go, making making up pages as I go or okay. I'll send an outline to a publisher and then I'll kind of loosely follow the outline because uh, I I have I, not to sound like an asshole but like I've done this enough that I I can look at an outline and go I can make a good comic from that mm -hmm. and yeah. um, publishers tend to trust me to do it yes. um and because I'm not I, I I'm not working for DC or Marvel I'm not doing a monthly book for anyone mm -hmm. Uh, I don't have to worry about very specifically sticking to a 22 or 18 or whatever page limit. That's true. Um, and then with this one, uh, Barbara asked me if I would if I would write at, at very least like the first two or three issues mm -hmm. uh, before I started drawing. And that was perfect because I was working on Haunted Hill at the time and that was really eating up all of my drawing time. And so I said, look, I'm going away to New York in a couple of months. Uh -huh. I will write I will write an issue every day for you while I'm there because I'm only going there to like walk around basically. 
Like mm-hmm. I just, I, I, I'd been in Canada for a year and a half and I was yes. losing my mind. I mm-hmm. needed to be around some real buildings. And I, I started writing it and it was meant to be this very, I and mean, this is the other part of, of Haunted Hill, of, of Four Color Heroes, is it was meant to be incredibly quick. Mm-hmm. When I pitched it, and I pitched it with the full outline, I said, I'll draw it in the similar style to Four Color Heroes. It'll be kind of a little bit cartoony, but it's mostly about facial expressions anyway, because it's about the human connection between these characters. Yes. Mm-hmm. And I'm not that experienced with drawing superhero stuff, so I'd rather keep that as simple as possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they said, great. And they said, how long will it take? And I said, it'll probably take two or three months to draw. Mm-hmm. Cut to me writing these scripts and then having like looking at them going, oh, these are really good though. And actually, I could really like bolster these by setting it in the real world. So I, that was when I brought in the New Zealand uh, thing to it because you know I, I had lived in New Zealand for thirty years. Yes. Um, and it it I, I needed these characters to feel grounded in something, mm-hmm. and I also knew that if I didn't specify where it was, if I didn't specify the church and mm-hmm. the beliefs of it it would read as um a kind of a lazy one-to-one for something like west bar baptist mm-hmm. and i think that's a cartoonish level of villainy mm-hmm. that i'm not particularly interested in highlighting mm-hmm. i would rather look at like what are the very small things and the, the 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 things we don't notice that ease their way into our real lives that are just all about homophobia and misogyny and all mm-hmm. of the other things that are just holding us back yeah and so uh when I started adding in this reality to it, the scripts became a lot more specific and a lot better. And mm-hmm. then at the end of my week in New York, I had these uh, the seven chapters written and Barbara and Bryant had been reading them as I went along and approving them and making their notes, what have you. And then I started drawing and I was like, I'll mm-hmm. still do it in that simple style. And I got three pages in and I was like, I am doing a disservice to this script. Mm-hmm. This has the potential to be one of the best books I've ever made, mm-hmm. uh, at least so far. And I need to, I need to start again. Uh, yeah. And so I then I, I, I took a step back and started doing research into like, I want this to, the New Zealand part of it started feeling very important and I wanted it to feel like it was steeped in that world. Mm-hmm. So I couldn't just say it is New Zealand. Yeah. I had to think, What are the trees like in New Zealand? What's the architecture like? I wanted it to feel like I was there while I was drawing it. And a lot of it is just based on memory, but like, you know, I've been very specific about what kind of posters are on the walls of the classrooms, what kind of color schemes are in those classrooms, the model of desk, the model of school, Mm -hmm. uh, what buses are driving around. I've done a lot of incredibly detailed uh, street scenes as like the school bus drives through or waiting at the bus stop. A lot of this is bus based, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, like to the point of I'm, I'm, I'm doing like, deep google research to find old stock footage of like things and and, like news reports that i can screen grab so that i can just like color sample the 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 fabric on the bus seat or like you know if you there there's a scene um where they're just walking down a a street there's a there's a big protest happening Mm -hmm. um and i thought okay well i need to set that in the real place and so then i'm looking up what the real place looks like and i'm thinking no, I know those aren't the stores that were there in 2004, though. So then I'm having to, like, research what store was in that place and what was their logo. But then, of course, I can't, like, infringe on their copyright or whatever, so I have to come up with a fake version of that store that people don't know will know it. And it's... I have, like, I have a... I had to buy one of those plastic chests of drawers that are on wheels that never... that always look like they're going to work really well at Office Depot, and then you get them home and they're just crap. Yeah. Um, But it's literally filled with printouts of different locations and mm-hmm. notes and like i i i have no system for it at all so every time i get to a new scene i'm like oh we're back in that spot hang on let me like and i unload all of like thousands of sheets of paper and like flick through them trying to find <laughs> what it was that i had there last time mm-hmm. and so it's become um yeah it went from being a two or three month project to being a thing that i started in april and here we are in december and i'm not finished so but i overwhelming and terrifying but it's gonna be so good and i'm gonna finish it on time still so that's the most important part yes Mm -hmm. 
But I think the amazing thing, Richard, is that it's a very personal story to you. And, you know, this is, you know, you just want to make sure, you know, in, in this moment, you know, during this time, is that you want to make sure it's done right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, because just just to hear the passion in your voice about this, not only the story, but it's like also too, like you said, you know, you don't want to just put, hey, we're in New Zealand and then that's it. It's like you said, you want to make sure that, you know, the protest is in the accurate location, what stores were there, you know, um, what, you know, the time period that it took place, the, mm-hmm. like you said, the, well, the, it's the, almost, it's almost like writing a fantasy story in that sense. Like the, the best high fantasy is always something that's pretty similar to our world, but with some magic thrown in so that it feels familiar, but also incredible. Mm-hmm. And I'm hoping, like, I think that for people who are in New Zealand, it'll feel really connected and really real and like the place they are yes. but still a little distance because it's you know 18 or 19 years ago mm-hmm. um and i think that for people in the rest of the world they'll go i can tell this is a real place i do not feel i feel like a tourist here but i don't feel like an alien mm-hmm. um, and i i you know one of the things i i noticed um you know i i, I live in canada and it's or have about half the time and it's weirdly similar to where i grew up Mm -hmm. uh and not just because like we have certain trade agreements and we're part of the commonwealth and a lot of the malls have stores from new zealand in them um but like the color of the sky the color of the grass the color of the trees is really similar Mm -hmm. um the architecture is incredibly different so it doesn't feel right Mm -hmm. but when i was looking at pictures of new zealand and i was in la at the time and i was like oh that's right new zealand's a different color it's actually just a different color than here because yeah. the ozone hole is there. And so the light comes through differently. And like, that's a little bit of a never ending story. The water is made of oil and it's toxic, but sure <laughs> is a beautiful thing, I guess. But sorry, that's embarrassing. That's never ending story too, not one. Um, but it, it makes a difference. It makes mm-hmm. a difference. And so like when I'm coloring it, I have to stop and go, uh, like okay, well these are these are the swatches that I use for an outdoor scene in Black Sand Beach or uh, Blastosaurus or whatever, mm-hmm. and I'm like, oh, but that sky doesn't work, and these trees, like these these twelve different colors of green, none of them are New Zealand green, mm-hmm. so I've got to go back and like figure out what is that, what is that when I reduce the K value so it'll print nicely, mm-hmm. like how do I capture this look, mm-hmm. and it's yeah, and I, and I think also because of the um because of like fantasy superhero moments in it, which are so like, there's, they're so outlandish Mm -hmm. uh, that I need the other stuff to feel incredibly real. But the, there's all of these little Easter eggs in it. Like, because, because Oscar hasn't really seen much of the world, Mm -hmm. um, he can't even imagine places that aren't, that that are like that far outside of his own experience. Mm -hmm. So there's a scene that I'm coloring today, actually, where, Telecos is fighting the Harpoonicorns in space, and it turns out the Harpoonicorns and the Neptunians don't want a peace treaty. They mm-hmm. want to have a war, so they throw Telecos back to Earth, but the condensed time bubble throws them into a future world where a supervillain has taken over. Um, that's like it's you know it's it's bombastic superhero stuff, right? Mm-hmm. But when he comes crashing down to Earth, uh, the way Oscar imagines it is he comes crashing down like through the roof of this very like significant church. Yes. Because that's a building that he's familiar with. And yeah. when Teleco sees all the billboards everywhere saying that Mondar has taken over the planet and that everyone is now loyal to him, mm-hmm. all the billboards are on, on uh, co- more colorful versions of buildings that I ha- have had Oscar walk past earlier in the book. So I know that he has seen them. Yeah. He knows what the Burger King looks like mm-hmm. with the movie theater next to it and the big billboard that's on that building. So that's where he sees Mondar, just more colorful now. Mm-hmm. Sorry, this is so like inside baseball nerd stuff. No, but but the thing, no, but Richard, but the thing is, but you know, um, again, like I'm going to keep repeating this: is that this is, you know, this is, you know, the story that you want to, um, you put your heart and your soul into this, you know, and you just want to make sure it's, you know, like you said, you know, you know, for readers when they read this, if they're not from New Zealand or, or a certain part of New Zealand they're tourists there and if it's a new zealander who's lived in that area they're going to go yes i remember this place yes this really Mm -hmm. looks familiar you know i'm also doing a thing where 
uh, I've, I've gone through like all my photos on Facebook and all my friends' photos on Facebook. Uh, and I've like mined them for like pictures of houses people used to live in. And, and mm -hmm. I've kind of, I've put together a map where I can figure out, I know where every character lives. And yes. there's even like an abandoned house that I've been obsessed with. Uh, mm -hmm. which ironically like during the time that i've been drawing this book that house has been like cleaned up and put up for sale uh -huh. uh, so the you know i wanted to give the characters their own fortress of solitude essentially yes mm -hmm. so there's in the first issue they walk past an abandoned house and uh patrick picks up a, a rock and throws it through the window and, and mm -hmm. says like okay first one to miss loses and oscar says i don't want to do that he says, why not? He says, I just, I think I'd rather make things better than worse. And it's kind of the driving force of their whole, whole relationship is that like Patrick hears that and it, it it's the first time someone's ever kind of put that into words and he realizes he kind of wants to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so they end up, uh, they, Patrick breaks into the house and they kind of clean it up together and make it their own like hide hideout where like Patrick's friends and brother and awful father won't bother them with yes. it while they read comic books and mm -hmm. oscar's church won't know that he's there yeah and mm -hmm. um and i you know i love abandoned houses and i love the idea of a cleaned up abandoned house where you make your own hideout that's the, mm -hmm. the you know a place that everyone overlooks and has become forgotten yes um but you know because i know where that house is i was like okay so from that house i need to make sure that i know where the bus stop is that they'll walk to that house from and so then i can have what they walk past because they're mm -hmm. going to walk past that same stuff six or seven times yes. but i don't want it to feel too real to people and i don't want people looking at it and going oh actually that person wouldn't have had their recycle bin in that location at that, yeah. that house yes so i'm doing things like i'm i'm i have them walk the wrong way the first time mm -hmm. um and there's an implication that oscar is trying to like lose patrick and not show him where he lives but has <laughs> to come back onto it eventually give up and come back onto the path home mm -hmm. but i'm also like I'm flipping images so that they're like the house would be on the wrong side of the street and yes. the fence goes like they go down a hill instead of up and just little tweaks to it. So it's exactly like New Zealand, mm -hmm. but just not like you'll look at it. You won't know why it's wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it, there's there, there. I'm probably putting too much thought into the psychology of this for the reader, but I hope some of it works. No, but that's, I gotta say that's Richard. That's, that's amazing. It really is. Um, Richard, I'm sorry. I um I'm gonna start slowly wrapping things up because I wanted to try to, you know, uh keep this to an hour and then I because I don't want to take too much of your time because you're still working. Oh, you're, you're all good, but yeah, whatever you want to do. Okay. So um it's my fault for talking. <laughs> no, 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 Richard, <laughs> no, Richard, no. Um no, because the thing is is that you know, the story of, now, correct me about your main character's name, Oscar and Patrick, the story, you know, this is an important story for you to tell about Oscar and Patrick. And also, too, I think what's also, you know, also important to you, too, is to make sure the setting is correct. Mm -hmm. you know, as much as you can, yeah, it, you know, as, as much as you can, you know, and, and, and just for you to put a lot more put now to put a lot of thought into it that's amazing and incredible about the research and so forth well I think and, a lot of it is that you know i honestly i never felt very happy in new zealand um mm -hmm. i was always the weirdo always the outcast i was people would say words to me like you're too smart for your own good which i always think is nonsense um but i knew that if i was going to do this I had to become obsessed with it. Mm -hmm. um, if I was, if I was going to care about it enough, I couldn't like from the reason I don't do comic strips is because in a comic strip, you draw the first one and you make it beautiful. And then you start finding the shortcuts so you can draw it faster. Yes. And mm -hmm. because it's the same thing each time, you know, not all, but a lot of comic strips are basically the same format every time. Mm -hmm. um, you are able to find those shortcuts. And I started a comic strip when I was 20 and day it was just two people talking and mm -hmm. that was you know that was it so there was really not a lot going on but the first strip they were uh at a table with shelves behind them and then i thought okay well i could add those digitally so i can just 
Okay, so then this, the second strip, I just drew the line for the table and the people, and I thought I'll drop that mm -hmm. bookshelf in next time because it took a long time to draw all those books. And then uh, let's just say that by the fifth strip, mm -hmm. uh, they were inside a cupboard. I wasn't even drawing the people. I was just <laughs> drawing the word balloons because it was dark. Mm -hmm. Like As soon as I have one shortcut, I'll take them all. Mm -hmm. I have to make my work as hard as possible so that it is always interesting. Oh. And so I treated New Zealand the same way. Like if I was going to do this, I had to make myself care about it so much more than like just being a grumpy teenager who wanted to leave. Yeah. I'm going to say, please don't take this the wrong way, but, but I think it kind of shows that you do love New Zealand. And somehow no, you missed it a little bit. Um, I don't. I don't think that's it. I think that I I write my stories a lot of the time for uh for the person who I was. Right, like when I was when I'm writing kids books, uh, I write kids books that encourage kids to imagine things, don't trust adults, believe in themselves, and find mm -hmm. the way through. Um, and I make them weird and I make them gross and I make them sometimes scarier than most kids' books would be uh -huh. um, because I'm writing them not for me now, but for me then, because I wish I'd had that. Mm. And I'm writing this book that clearly shows that the world they're in is hard and unpleasant and really limited by so many forces. Uh -huh. um, but I think that if I had read that when I was that age, I wouldn't have started liking my life anymore, but I would have certainly felt like at least someone out there saw me. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that I, I got into a really bad uh, friendship when I was a, a teenager. I met for, I, I'd never met another writer ever in my life. Mm -hmm. And then I met a man who was a published novelist mm -hmm. and he would never let me read his novels. And I did when I was like in my late twenties and they were mm -hmm. absolute garbage. Um, but it was so exciting for me as a 13 year old to meet a writer. And I was like, finally, my master splinter has arrived. I can have a mentor. And it was the most toxic and awful relationship. He drained me of everything for years. He has credits on multiple series of mine where he really just didn't contribute anything. Um, but it was, I was so desperate to feel like, like I was part of something and not yes. just out there flailing on my own. Yeah. And so I'm hoping this book can do that for someone mm -hmm. and like because there were there were so many books that i read as a kid that were like here's this fun of like i, I used to, I, I wanted to move to america so bad mm -hmm. and like when i was eight years old i was watching baywatch mm -hmm. and uh you know in baywatch when they when they swim it's so obviously a tank yes and i asked my mother why that was and my mother being wrong about everything said um it's it's because they film it in Los Angeles and the water there is so dirty you can't swim in it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, all right. And I immediately decided, I'm like, I'm going to live in Los Angeles then because I hate going to the beach and I have to go to the beach all the time because my dad's really into sailing and mm -hmm. my sister's really into sailing mm -hmm. and we are we live near three different beaches. And I hate it. I hate it so, so much. Mm -hmm. If I move to Los Angeles, I'm not even allowed to go swimming. That yeah. sounds perfect. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and it was the same, like, throughout my teenage years, I would find books and TV shows that always made other places seem wonderful. Mm -hmm. And there was nothing that made, or, or at least, like, other places where people were weird outcasts but found their community, <laughs> or, like, mm -hmm. were weird outcasts but were understood by at least one other person. And I didn't have that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, like, if I'd had a book about the place that I grew up that showed someone like me being okay and not like that kid doesn't play rugby he's not a real new zealander mm -hmm. and then at the end of the story he realizes that rugby is fun after all mm -hmm. cool what a great what a great book i'm being forced to read mm -hmm. and so i i i i i don't miss new zealand okay. um there are people there i miss like yeah three people there i miss but um yeah I, this is this is my book that I'm. I wish I could send back in time and say, "Here you go, Richard. Enjoy this one." Richard, I'm going to say thank you very much for sharing that. Thank you very much. And yeah, yeah. 
um, I'm sorry, Richard. I'm gonna I I I'm gonna still continue. I gotta continue on. I'm sorry, but like I said, thank you very much. Yeah, just thank you very much for sharing that answer. Yeah. Um. I know this story is going to be translated in. I'm going to try to pronounce the language. Te, te Rio Maori. It's uh, Te Reo. Te Reo. Te Reo. I'll go on the R. Okay. Um, yeah. So this is, I mean, this comes back to this other thing about like the weirdness of the, the value of, of a culture. And, you know, like living in Canada, it's so ordinary. Like every, everything is in French and English. Mm -hmm. right? Yes. It's just, all, all our food packaging, all of just the signs, everything. And, uh, you know, whether you speak French or not, it's just there and it's completely mm -hmm. accepted and it's normal. Mm -hmm. uh, New Zealand, when I was growing up, didn't have that. Like, Te Reo Māori is the other official language of New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, it was forcibly wiped out for decades and there's, like, a much darker history mm -hmm. to that. But, um, you know, it is it, it's an official language of the country. And I grew up in a very uh, white area, mm -hmm. uh, a very, uh, like, dull middle-class suburbia. Um, and, I mean, I remember I was with my friend and his mother, uh, we were 14 or 15, and there was a glass door with the word out on it. Mm -hmm. But the word out is also, like, in, in all, all caps, is... 2O backwards. Oh, okay. And 2O, to be fair, could pretty easily sound like a a, a, a Maori word, mm -hmm. right? But my friend's mother looked at the word out written backwards on a door, misunderstood how doors worked, and went, Ugh, they bloody put that stuff everywhere, don't they now? <laughs> no, they don't. And also, what? <laughs> what is wrong with you? Mm -hmm. um, but you know, growing up feeling not connected to the place that I that I was, mm -hmm. I look at it now and I wonder, like, if if Maori culture had been like a much bigger part of my day to day life in a way that it, I think it is now a lot more for mm -hmm. for young people. Yes. Um. Maybe I would have felt more connected. Maybe I would have. May, maybe that would have made a difference. Mm -hmm. Um. And so I thought, like, if I'm gonna, like, if I'm gonna uh, make a book about this place if i'm going to set something there then like it deserves to be it deserves to be both like i'm not i'm not going to be another thing contributing to the problem mm -hmm. um and and like what's interesting is i've been gone from there now for six years mm -hmm. and uh i was talking to my my agent and uh she said oh yeah no this is this is like a really normal thing that's kind of it's happened since you've been gone a lot of books are coming out in both languages oh, okay. and um and that was this that was actually after I had like arranged with fan base to have that done and we'd found the translators and everything. Yes. Uh, and it was interesting that like it took us a while to find uh 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 Kamaka and I am blanking on the name of the other translator because I've only met Kamaka so far. Is it Ale um, Alejandra Jensen? Alejandra Jensen, yes, thank you. Um uh it took us a while to find uh them because like it turns out there's a lot of people doing translations now and that's awesome mm -hmm. um so I, I was i was pretty passionate about like making sure this was like available in both languages um it's only it, like we're not doing a print edition for new zealand specifically because like with shipping the way it is these days it's going to cost like 50 bucks a book to send it there you know mm -hmm. um so we're doing the digital version uh, in both languages, the print version is just in English and mostly for North America. I mean, it's available for pre-order; anyone can get it. But like shipping to New Zealand is a lot. Um, yes. But I'm hoping that we can find a, a publishing partner down there to do a specific New Zealand edition in both languages for schools and libraries and all the places that, like, frankly, should have more comic books. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, I'm, this is an off-the-cuff question. I'm going to ask, and if you don't know, that's fine. Um like because i know you're still working on it but are it is like at least the first issue is available digitally now or are you gonna or let me ask you this are you gonna release it as like a graphic novel digitally complete the whole complete story 
yes, it'll just be a graphic novel uh, digitally and physically in, I think, July uh, oh. 2023. Oh, um, okay. I know that it's uh, it's available for pre-order now, though. I know that yes. much. Um, yes. On the fan base press website. Mm -hmm. um, and I, because I'm being a perfectionist about this, by the way, I've never colored superhero comics before either. So I've mm -hmm. literally put in like 140 hours of time watching YouTube videos while I'm working to learn all of these like other coloring techniques that are like so much more mm -hmm. about like gradients and different fancy brushes and special uh -huh. effects and things. Um, so I'm being this weird perfectionist about it. And I, the, the first issue I sent them completed with all of the coloring, rendering, everything done. Mm -hmm. Second issue I sent them with just the flat colors. And then I was like, I've changed my mind about how I'm coloring this book. I will send you all of these things as just, just the inks and the lettering. Um, and I will color the whole thing in one go once I've learned everything I can about it. Okay. I finished all seven issues like that. And now I'm recoloring the first one and recoloring the second one and like it's, I I feel like I'm about I'm about two weeks away from someone's gonna like walk in I I, I for in my mind for some reason they lift a garage door even though I don't work in a garage uh -huh. and I'll just be there with strings everywhere with notes about like sorry I don't mean to laugh sorry la layer twelve layer twelve needs to be set to multiply at forty nine percent this. Use the KNKL brush set on color dodge. Mm -hmm. Top layer screen black. Like it's just it's it's gonna be like I'm I'm at a point now where I I can tell you like the color the like the numeric values of everyone's skin and hair color for the book. <laughs> oh, all right, Richard. I'm sorry. Um. I don't want to try to, I'm going to, let me try to wrap things up real quickly because I don't want to keep you too much because I don't want, please, I'm joking on this part because I don't want you to lose the, the color numberings, <laughs> you know, <laughs> all right. Um, um, you know, um, how did you team up with Sandbase Press? I, I mean, I know you were like in contact with them, but how did that come about? Um, it was okay. So there's, um, I don't know if you've heard about it, but there's this global pandemic um, that just mm -hmm. will yeah. not go away. Um, and right at the beginning of it, I actually, I didn't realize this, but I'd met Barbara and Bryant at Long Beach Comic Con in like 2018, I think. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, but just for like like 30 seconds, you know, we'd spoken briefly. Mm -hmm. um, and then at the beginning of the pandemic, when the first lockdown kind of hit, uh, I was living in Hollywood still, mm -hmm. and I was like, I was being so strict on all of this stuff. Like, I didn't. Yeah. I, well, I, I don't want to say I didn't leave my house because uh, I I walked to my office each day, and the building, the entire complex was abandoned, mm -hmm. so I could like interact with zero people, and I I masked even while I was outdoors, you know, mm -hmm. and I wasn't speaking to anyone except on the internet, mm -hmm. and I saw on Facebook that. Um, my friend David Avalone was uh, oh. had shared a link to uh, fan base do a thing called Coffee and Comics, mm -hmm. um, which I think I think it was called Coffee and Comics, uh, or no, it's called Coffee and Comics now. It was called the fan base something something else. Mm -hmm. And every Saturday morning, there's a Zoom call for LA comic creators, which is kind of expanded now to include like some people like uh, Simon Burks and and uh, Simon and Mariel Burks from Blue Fox Comics over in Scotland are there and. Uh, my friend Lucy Campagnolo, who I wrote um, Shed with, uh, it was on it for a little while. She's in London, and there's you know, the people everywhere. Um, but it's just a way of us like staying connected with other comic creators <laughs> who we would normally only see at conventions. Yes, yeah. And I I showed up, and I kind of assumed that everyone there was like best friends already, and everyone knew each other, mm -hmm. and that this had been going on for months. I later found out that I had joined week two. And mm -hmm. that no one on the call had like ever met in real life. Uh -huh. It was just purely by chance. And I very quickly, I think, became like, I'm the king of oversharing. Like, I think I was, it was maybe three weeks into it before I was like telling everyone the story of the time I ate too many bananas and my shit changed texture for a few days and now <laughs> I can't eat bananas. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, you know, like, 
there's and there's like a number of people out there who like if they hear bananas get mentioned they'll tag me and they'll be like hey richard i heard about bananas again and that made me think of your story thanks <laughs> hey richard i had a banana smoothie today and you know <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> i don't anyway, i'm sorry i, I was joking for when this happened but <laughs> um and and uh we 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 got along incredibly well and then uh in the i think it was maybe a year in a year and a bit in i had decided when everyone else was like making banana bread and all that stuff mm -hmm. i was like i'm gonna be so ready for covid to be over i'm gonna have 10 graphic novels that i will release all at the same time and i will i'll be the only person who's like taking comics by storm yeah. I didn't even think to do Kickstarter or join any of the, like, I, I did it so stupid. I, like, buried my head and made stuff and didn't connect with the world. Mm -hmm. And, I, like, so it was, I had this list. I have a, um, I'm, I'm in my, I'm in my writing office now, which is my mm -hmm. nice indoor one because it's the middle of winter. But for a long time, my writing office was in a, a haunted house that I'd built for my wedding uh, that I'd converted to a writing space. Mm -hmm. And it was like always kept it below freezing. And mm -hmm. Apparently that's good for your thinking. And I had a whiteboard out there and written on it. It said, um, it said gay Bigfoot story, uh, Hollywood garbage story, mm -hmm. gay superhero, and then asterisk uh, romantic. <laughs> um, like, like all of these like notes on that. And like, People would come to like, what is that? I'm like, I know exactly what all of those are. I have the full stories figured out. These and it was a list of ten. These are the things I'm going to make. Mm -hmm. And I just started like churning these things out. I made, I, I wrote a memoir, mm -hmm. uh, like a full graphic novel length memoir in the first month and a half. Um, I did this book for Blue Fox Comics called Shed, mm -hmm. uh, which yeah. came out on Kickstarter earlier this year and is is now available for pre order on their site. Um, about uh, a small town and a sea monster and uh, again I mean, a, a, another another richard classic it's about misogyny and homophobia mm -hmm. and the cross section of the venn diagram where they meet um and I, like i just i was just making books and making books and mm -hmm. i was like i don't need to I, I don't need to be in bookstores i don't need to be in comic stores i don't need to be pushing any of these things into like mm -hmm. i don't want to go to a big publisher again i'm with i like i i I've been with Scholastic, I've been with Penguin, I've been with Pixel and Ink, and I, I'm sort of tired of taking that route because this magical goal of being in bookstore markets mm -hmm. and uh, apparently magically selling tens of thousands of copies is fake. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's a it's an industry trick that uh, where it works like the music industry, you know, for every hundred artists, one of them makes a profit and they mm -hmm. just wait and see which one takes off before they choose who to publicize. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, I looked at what fan base were doing uh, and they were promoting uh, nuclear power at the time. Yes. Yeah. And uh, they had sent me just a, a, a preview issue of it and said, like, let, let people know if you like this. And the press release was so good. Mm -hmm. And like so professional, and I don't want to say that as if it's dismissive, but like, there is no way that I would have looked at the way they were promoting nuclear power and thought this is a company run by two people who are also raising twins. Yes, yeah. Like I would, I would never have believed that in mm -hmm. my wildest dreams, except that I knew them and I knew what they were doing. Um, and I was like, I whatever I do, I want to have a book with them because they will treat it like I was. I was getting some pretty shitty treatment from um from a, a publisher i was with at the time who was like changing release dates without and not telling me um oh. and there was a whole thing where a, a book came out and they're like we need something else to publicize it um can we like let us know what the budget would be to do like a podcast based on the book and so i started putting it together and i was like we'll do short episodes i'll record it with some actors because i lived in a recording studio at the time mm -hmm. and i can do it all remotely and safely and um and i was like like let's discuss budget and they're like okay but the book's already out so we need something out like this week and and we'll figure that part out later mm -hmm. and at this time they'd been really nice to me so i believed them uh and so i produced the entire first season of this podcast and then that awful publisher turned around and said oh well if we do a season two we'd look at paying you mm. so it was things like that that i've been getting and that's not you know that's not an that's not a, that's not a standalone incident 
Mm -hmm. uh, in the world of publishing. And you can talk to anyone in comics. They have a hundred stories like that from different places. Mm -hmm. And fan base were just above board. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I just, I want to spend some time while I can't leave the house. I want to spend some time working for people who respect me and treat mm -hmm. comics well. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and so I went to them. I was like, hey, I have seven stories that I haven't placed with anyone yet. Mm -hmm. uh, let me pitch them to you. And they were like, sure. And they like, Literally in an hour, I gave them a full rundown of all seven graphic novels that I hadn't sold. Mm -hmm. And um, they were like, they liked this one the most. Mm -hmm. So I said, cool. And I'd actually, I had been waiting about 10 years to do this one. I'd had the idea for it a long time ago um, in a very kind of rudimentary form. But like mm -hmm. the core of it of one boy describes comics to another boy who's not allowed to read them and he imagines them mm -hmm. as a way of falling in love. Like was that, that was always there. That was, that was the beginning of it um, and I I kind of never made it because I always thought like I'm not good enough at writing yet to do this I'm not good enough at drawing yet to do this mm -hmm. uh, there was a, there was a point years ago where I actually was like reaching out to all of my like superhero comic creator friends mm -hmm. and being like would you want to do one of the superhero stories and we kind mm -hmm. of like it's you know and then I looked and I was like that's gonna be so messy mm -hmm. and it's, it's like I I there's nothing I hate more than picking up a book and being like oh cool 12 different art styles it, yeah um, mm -hmm. So I, I, I just decided I had to do it myself, but I had to wait until I was ready to do it. And this just felt like the right time. That's right. Really he nice. said with confidence as he knows that he's going to go and like watch 13 more videos to make sure he's doing things <laughs> right. It's, it's so weird. Like when I'm, when I'm drawing, I'm amazing with a pen, you know, like I'm not the most technically skilled artist in the world, but I can tell a damn good story. Mm -hmm. And I can, like, I can control face shapes and I can control expressions and I can control poses in a way that, I'm very proud of like I'm mm -hmm. but you know with a pen and paper it feels like art yeah. with digital it mm -hmm. can be broken down to individual pixels and something in my brain goes there is a way to be technically correct with this and you're not doing it and I I, I go down a horrible spiral because of it whereas the reality is like no one's going to look at a printed page and be like oh you didn't technically do an explosion the correct way did you Richard mm -hmm. you're kicked out of comics now oh I'm sorry about that <laughs> it's awful when I get kicked out of comics. <laughs> um, I'm gonna ask you three more questions because I'm gonna I wanna, you know, wrap this up because I wanna I because I wanna make sure you have your time to do your work. I will just stay awake longer. It's completely fine. Okay. I, I, right. My like my minimum look, the minimum I can survive on is three hours a night. Uh and and mm -hmm. I will be absolutely fine with that. Mm -hmm. Red Bull coffee riddle and I lived in a um the first I've lived in three different recording studios in my life because uh stumbling into garbage. Um and the first one I lived in in LA was um was actually was Ryan Gosling's old studio. And so all the walls were painted with his like weird art of werewolves. Uh -huh. The place was called Werewolf Heart, and it's since been uh it got sold actually earlier this year, which is kind of sad. Um but when I was living there, it was at the top of a hill. Uh, and the water was undrinkable because it's LA. So uh -huh. if I wanted water, I can't drive, I'm blind. So I'd have to walk down and carry a lot of heavy water up a hill. Oh God, yes. However, the studio was sponsored by Red Bull. Uh -huh. And so I could just drink Red Bull instead. And so for like 10 months, me and my roommate were just like, why are we working so fast? We're always got so much energy. This yes. is so weird. <laughs> I, I have this rash all around my heart. What do you think that's from? <laughs> Now, the rash around the heart actually turned out to be because he was using uh, screen wipes instead of soap because he thought they would clean him better. Oh, okay. <laughs> Fully grown adult man. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I, I, I got like really into Red Bull for a long time. And actually, after I moved out of there, um, I knew that the Red Bull delivery happened at like 4 a.m. on a Friday and my office was in within walking distance. And so every Friday I would like leave my office at 4 a.m., walk up the hill and be like, it's fine to carry Red Bull down the hill and steal 36 cans for the week. Wow. <laughs> God, I missed that free Red Bull. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, look, I, 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 I don't need a lot of sleep. But one of the tricks I learned is that if you, if you're going to sleep very little, you have to do it in multiples of ninety minutes. Mm 
Okay. Because that way you wake up when you're you're closest to being awake anyway, and you don't feel jolted awake. Mm -hmm. All right. So your three questions. Yeah. No. No. I'm. I'm just. I'm just amazed. Richard is like, wow. That's. <laughs> that's an incredible schedule your sleeping schedule and wow you know it's just until i finish this book and two others mm -hmm. okay <laughs> and then whatever else i come up with <laughs> um now um for four color heroes um i now correct me if i'm wrong you do the writing the drawing the lettering the coloring um i'm i'm just going to ask is there anyone else on the creative is there anyone else on the creative team team that you want to give a shout out to no nope. on this book okay i will i will shout out my other collaborators on things i mean and most of that is just lucy campagnolo who co-wrote shed with me mm -hmm. um because that book is like wonderful and i'm so 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 proud of it mm -hmm. um but no this one has been has been me from start to finish um okay. there's uh yeah, no, there's like like the, the comic of it all has absolutely no one else involved. Um, I mean, like in terms of the production of it, mm -hmm. like like as an editor, Barbara has been fantastic. Oh, okay. uh, and her and Bryant came up with some incredible feedback on it. Actually, there was a, a whole chapter added because they were like, they realized like, hey, you've been in this story for 10 years. Yes. You skipped over some stuff that the readers need to know. And right. like it, it unlocked a huge thing. And that like they they have been great with that. Mm -hmm. um and again incredibly quick with that um the our, our our translators are are wonderful and have been great to work with uh so far and i'm looking forward to like the complicated nature of relettering a book and still having the right words be in bold or italicized for emphasis of dialogue but mm -hmm. that's a whole headache that i'm not ready for yet mm -hmm. um and, and uh uh there's going to be there's going to be a couple of essays in the back of the book Oh, okay. um, and I, I, I would love to shout out those people, but I don't think it's been announced yet. So I don't oh, okay, think yeah. I'm allowed to. That's fine. Um, yeah. But let me just say one of them is a writer who I really respect and really like, and whose real name I thought was just a Halloween Twitter name for a long time mm -hmm. because I followed him on Twitter during October. And then, uh, <laughs> And then, like in January, I was like, "Dude, you've got to change your name back to whatever it really is. This is just embarrassing." <laughs> Halloween's over already. Come on, you know. Yeah. It turns out his real name is yeah. David S. Pumpkins. <laughs> <laughs> Dumb. Dumb joke. That was a good one. You know what? You know what sucks about David S. Pumpkins, apart from all of it, is that I had that suit for years before that sketch happened. Oh my and like, god! And like when when that sketch came, I was like, oh, guess I can never wear that again <laughs> because people are gonna go, you stole that from um, Saturday Night Live. <laughs> yeah, I was like, no, no, this is this is just this is from a company called Oppo Suits, uh -huh. who do like if you've ever seen like a suit covered in question marks or dollar bills or pumpkins or whatever. Oppo suits and they're wonderful and i will say this i have never in my life been to a pride parade wearing that pumpkin suit <laughs> and not got some serious action because of it <laughs> that suit's a winner and now i can't wear it because people are like oh your dress is tom hanks yeah um, tom hanks. um i'm gonna i'm just gonna ask do you want to give a shout out to your husband you know, during all sure. you know, yeah sure he, he'll i'll say to him you should listen to this podcast and he'll say like, what and then he'll ask me to set it up for him and i won't um <laughs> yes my 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 husband who who has put up with so much through mm -hmm. like this year has been more intense than any other year for me for work mm -hmm. um and like it's we have a we have a system set up now where uh rather than decide what to eat for ourselves we have a big jar on top of the fridge with numbered balls inside of it and we draw it like a lottery every morning mm -hmm. because like the idea of having to actually plan a meal is 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 too much for my brain when i'm like i've been up for five hours mm -hmm. do you like i've been working since since 4 a.m today do you expect me to try and think of like whether we're going to have greek chicken or salmon for dinner i don't i don't know i don't know yeah. just pull the ball 
Um, so like he's he's put up with some some buck wild uh, <laughs> like he he yeah I I, I thought it was. I have a lot of sympathy for him. He did once say to me, he's like, when it's like, when it's this much work, it feels like we're just, I'm just alone in the house with a person who doesn't look up from their desk. And I'm like, is it okay? He's like, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. As long as there's an end date. I'm like, yeah, it's just this book and two more. <laughs> oh. But we have like, he, um, he uh, hurt his knee last year. Oh, I'm and sorry. And so we've been waiting for a, a knee replacement and Canadian healthcare. There's a huge doctor shortage. Yes. And so uh, there was a three-year wait list and we had to go private and go out of province. But, but as of last week, um, we went to we went to Montreal and he got a new knee. Oh, and so good. He's, in, he's recovering from that now. But um, also, I, I, I went all the way to Montreal and didn't leave the hotel even once because I was working the whole time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which is, I've always wanted to go to Montreal. Yes. Um, yeah. So uh, he's 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 recovering, and so like the plan is that next year, um, my like one of my best friends is getting married in in uh, April, so I'm flying to Australia for that, and we'll do some traveling. We'll probably go to Japan for a while, and um, oh, nice. go back to New York, which is where we went on our honeymoon. Honeymoon, we both love that place. Like I've been there a lot, but he's only been there the once. So we're going to do things. We're going to like we had this like before COVID, we had this wonderful life where. Every um, I would I would live in Hollywood for six weeks, then come here for two weeks, and he would do it on the opposite schedule. So we spent <laughs> half our time together. Um, and like he misses Hollywood a lot. I desperately miss Hollywood. Uh, it's mm -hmm. my favorite place in the entire world. Mm -hmm. um, it's the only place I've like truly felt at home mm -hmm. um, because it's for garbage people and the desperate. Apparently, <laughs> yeah, it just mm -hmm. makes me feel so comfortable. Um, so yeah, yeah, it'll 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 all be good. So yes, shout out to Raymond, my wonderful husband, mm -hmm. who really wishes I would stop posting so many weird pictures of him on the internet. <laughs> well, I'm I'm glad that Raymond got his his knee replacement and and he's reco and he's recovering right now. Correct? Right? So, Isn't yeah. it amazing that you ask me such a simple question? And I was like, let me tell you my life story. <laughs> no, but I mean, but Richard, I'm gonna say no, but I'm gonna say this is just thank you very much for for being open and sharing this as well just thank you very much yeah you, know, you are welcome yeah you know, thank you you know i i had this um one of the reasons that i'm like i'm not doing children's books anymore is because uh i always felt like i was having to skirt this line between like uh acceptable um acceptable behavior in public places and mm -hmm the kind of unapologetic dirtbag that I really am. And, you know, there's, there, there's obviously like just basic human decency where you're not being an unpleasant person to other people, mm -hmm. but there's also a time when like, I, for me, I have never deliberately, well, I can't say never, but like, you know, as an adult, I don't think I've ever deliberately tried to offend or shock. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and without fail, the times that I've offended or shocked people, it's always been because I, I was just saying something that I thought was normal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then it, like the turnaround on her, you know, and I, I, I was doing a lot of interviews for various kids books and I'd come away from it and I'd be like, oh God, did I say something wrong? What have I said? What have I said? What have I done? And then this year um, I put out Haunted Hill, which is like my favorite kind of very personal weird book. Um, and I was doing a lot of publicity for that around the beginning of the year. And I started mm -hmm. noticing that I was coming out of every interview feeling good. Mm -hmm. And I was just, you know, talking about whatever. And then I did an interview and I, I was like, I had a couple of different books coming out. Haunted mm -hmm. Hill was just wrapping up the first volume, which is 12 issues. Mm -hmm. And the, another book, which I won't say the name of because I'm actually refusing to publicly say the name of that book mm -hmm. uh, because I hate the publisher. Um, was coming out and I they basically an interviewer reached out and said we want to talk to you about your your comic and I was like okay great mm -hmm. and I thought I'll ask them at the beginning of it which one it is is it the yes, kids yeah. book or is the very adult book yeah and right before the interview started I had forgotten to ask and the guy said oh by the way I wanted to let you know I love Haunted Hill I was reading it last night yes and I was like oh it's about Haunted Hill let's mm -hmm. talk about that and cool yeah. I'm on board 
And the first question he said was, um, so a lot of the locations in your book are based on real places. Which one is your favorite? Mm -hmm. Now, the other book that is very much for children Mm -hmm. also has some real life places in it, but it's largely set in an actual fantasy world. So not even a slight clue that it could be about that. Yes. So I responded thinking we were talking about Haunted Hill with, oh, definitely Slamtown. It's based on my favorite sex club in L.A. And I'm not going to give the full rundown of things I said, but I might have said the words. It's great because you can stay standing. And obviously the floor there is pretty gooshy. So you don't want to be getting that on your pants. Mm -hmm. And this was on a live stream. Oh my God, I'm sorry. And I talked for maybe eight minutes before he said, okay, but back to the topic at hand and then said the name of the other book. And I was like, every time I cannot get it right. So I've just like, I'm uh, my, one of my best friends uh, died recently and he was uh, sorry. absolutely unapologetic in every part of who he was. And I realized like, I need to I need to be that. I can't I can't do this thing where I'm trying to juggle which public version of me I'm being. Yeah. So that's why I overshare. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, that happened to you on the live stream. I mean to be fair, it was very funny. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It's it's so it's so rare that you're on a live stream and you have a reason to see the words. Yeah. California's longest suckatorium. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, what were your other questions? Um I was gonna two more questions. I'm gonna ask, you know, have you and your family been to Hawaii? Um, I have not. And I, I when I was looking through the questions last night for this in advance. I I uh, was reading them aloud, and I said, "Oh no, I haven't." And Ray said, "I have. I went there for a weekend once. Tell them that." <laughs> like, All right. So Ray went there for a weekend once. He can't remember when. Okay. <laughs> um. Any closing? Any closing words to our, the last question? Any closing words to our listeners? I mean, that's. There's so much that 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 I could say. I I I I feel like you're setting me up to give like a, a, a Doctor Who about to regenerate oh. speech. So I'm just gonna say, never be cowardly, always be kind. Mm-hmm. And I'm gonna say, Richard, on that note, thank you very much. You know, I wish you all the success with Four Color Heroes graphic novel, and Mahalo. Thank you in Hawaiian. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to interview you um i also want to thank barbara of fanbase press for helping set up this interview you know and you if you are a new comic book reader or a lifelong comic book reader please check out the young adult graphic novel four color heroes from fanbase press um it will be it will be available digit um correct me if i'm wrong on this richard it'll be available digitally and hardcover next year is that correct Yes. Yes. All right. Um, and and as Richard has mentioned, it's going to be in in English and today or Maori. Yes. Thank you very much, Richard. And you can pre-order um the graphic novel graphic novel through Fanbase Press website, www.fanbasepress.com. Uh, pre-orders before May first, two thousand twenty-three. Um, you will receive a discounted price of. 19 of $19.99 and an exclusive print illustrated and signed by um by Richard. Correct me if I'm wrong on that, Richard. No, that is that is correct. I gotta learn okay. to spell my name. That's so important. Okay. And then and um and I want to thank Drew, the co-host of Comics for Fun and Profit. Drew, thank you very much for all your hard work behind the scenes. Thank you for putting this episode together. And if you are a new listener, please check out new episodes of Comics for Fun and Profit that comes out every Saturday. And until next, and I want to thank you, the listeners. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for listening to this episode. Until next time, guys. Aloha. Aloha. As you know, our LCS is Cowabunga Comics. 
Lake Country, Wisconsin's best pop culture destination for new comics, back issues, gaming, retro video games, vinyl, and figures. Give them a call, 262-569-9999. Check them out online at cowabungacomics.com or follow them on Twitter at Incredical. Um, they are our LCS, and we utilize their deep discount mail order service to bring Oconomowoc, Wisconsin closer to us. They'll take care of you. Tell them Drew and Kyle sent you. Say hi to Eric and James from us. If you need an LCS, you can't go wrong with Cowabunga Comics.